Welcome to this evening's Sam Fox School Public Lecture. Thank you for joining us. We are thrilled to have Erica Blumenfeld speaking about her work this evening. I'm Lisa Belosky. I'm the director of Island Press in the Sam Fox School. Island Press is a collaborative printmaking workshop that's embedded in the school and the curriculum. And we work with artists who are typically not printmakers in short residencies to collaborate and to educate. Island Press visiting artists work with our master printer and the students in the school to produce ambitious projects in small editions and multiples. Erica is our first ever remote visiting artist and we are really enjoying the process of working with her remotely this whole spring semester on a fascinating project that um, is both materially and conceptually uh, ambitious. Erica's talk tonight will be followed by a moderated discussion led by Tom Reed and Joseph Canasales. They will take questions from the audience, which you can put into the Q&A at any time. And now I'd like to introduce Tom and Joseph. Joseph Canasales is a first year MFA in visual art candidate from Miami, Florida. He received his BFA from the Kansas City Art Institute in 2020, majoring in sculpture. He attended the Yale Norfolk Summer Program and is a recipient of the 2018 McCune Grant, which allowed him to travel to Utah's national parks to study topography and geology, furthering his studio practice. His artwork is influenced by natural and geological formations, and his goal is to reveal a new perspective on our natural world through emerging technologies. And Tom Reed is the master printer for Island Press and a senior lecturer in the Sam Fox School. Tom is also a working artist and in the studio, whether at home with his own work or in the print shop with Island Press, he is a jack of all trades, a creative magician and a supreme collaborator. Tom is the master printer for artist projects, as I said, at Island Press. And tonight you'll get to hear a little bit about the project he's facilitating with Erica Blumenfeld. Tom's own artwork connects in a complementary way to Erica's, I think. His drawings and paintings and sculptures ask questions about how human beings fit into the landscape and how best to tell the interconnected story of our relationship to nature. So thank you, Joseph and Tom, for facilitating this discussion tonight, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Lisa. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. It's my pleasure to introduce our current Arthur L. and Sheila Prensky Island Press visiting artist, Erica Blumenfeld. Erica is a transdisciplinary artist working at the intersection of art, science, nature, and culture. She approaches her work like an archivist, driven by a passion to trace and collect the evidence and stories of connection across the cosmos. Her non-traditional research-based practice has led her to examine a range of subjects, including astronomy, geology, planetary science, ecology, the environment, anthropogenic climate, climate disruption, natural night sky preservation, and light in its many forms. This approach to her work has led her to collaborate with scientists and research institutions, including NASA and the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. Erica is a Guggenheim Fellow Smithsonian Fellow and a recipient of the Rauschenberg Foundation Artists in Residence and Creative Capital Grant. Blumenfeld's work has been exhibited widely in museums and galleries in the US and abroad, including the Albright Knox Art Gallery in Buffalo, Foundation EDF in Paris, France, Ballroom Marfa in Marfa, Texas, the OCA in San Paulo, Brazil, the Portland Institute for Contemporary Art in Portland, Oregon, and the Tate Modern in London to name a few. Please join me tonight. Um, I'm just so excited to hear this talk. Please uh, join me tonight in welcoming Erica Blumenfeld. Thank you so much, Tom, um, for this very, very warm welcome. And thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Um, I want to extend my sincere gratitude to both Lisa and Tom for inviting me to be the artist in residence this semester and for the opportunity to collaborate with Island Press. Um, it has been such a wonderful experience to work with your students and to think creatively with you both. And I'm really excited for how the project is evolving. 
Um, I also want to thank Joseph for joining us for the discussion afterwards and to Jonathan for running things behind the scenes. So my presentation is 45 minutes and there are two layers that I will be sharing with you. Um, the first layer is the realm of ideas and knowledge seeking that begins with questions, leads to research and writing and often ends with more questions. Um, the second layer consists of the artworks that arise in the wake of the research and the ideas. And as I share these vignettes of both the writing and the artwork, my hope is that together they weave a deeper story of my art practice. Uh, the images and writing reflect each other, but neither is punctuation or answer to the other, and they may not always sync up perfectly, but rather they will each have their own rhythm. So here we go. We cannot foresee how the journey of a creative idea will begin, but once the idea has sparked and taken hold, we can barely imagine its former absence. Whether my enduring childhood passion for the stars and obsession with rocks and fossils were all foreshadow, like a latent image imprinted on the core of my mind and heart, awaiting unified focus and development, or whether random events like the formation of the rocks and stars themselves coalesced and precipitated into form out of pure happenstance, I may never know. What is clear is that in the early days of August of 2011, while traveling to Inverness, Scotland from Glasgow, I drove through a road cut on a highway near the edge of the great Loch Ness that changed everything. In that fleeting instant in which eons of geology flew by my window, a seed was unknowingly planted, a seed that has evolved into now 10 years of creative focus that continues to bloom. But I'm getting ahead of myself. It began long before that. It really began with light. Light is truly one of the great wonders of our universe. Seemingly everywhere, it is but always fleeting. The desire to catch light and to know something of its essence underlies much curiosity of, between the arts and sciences across the ages. So much of our biology and sensory experiences are perfectly attuned to specific frequencies within the electromagnetic spectrum, visual, audio, thermal. One can imagine light as the great meeting between the ineffable and the tangible. Through light, we meet and embody the vastness of the cosmos. The ability of wavelengths in the visible spectrum to be emitted and absorbed by the various conditions and substances that the, in the world around us form the basis of illumination and color. Our beautiful blue sky, the brightness of the sun at midday, the orange hues at sunset sparkling across an ocean, the vibrant rainbows and the mysterious aurora borealis are all expressions of the phenomena of light bending, reflecting, refracting, and revealing the enigmatic subtlety of light's unyielding shifts in intensity and tone. My initial inquiry as a young photographer began with the question, what is the nature of light? My curiosity has not found rest in the answers to this question, however, but has grounded in the stream of questions that have continued to rise in its wake. Intellectually, we have formulated an understanding of the workings of light, but it is in the wondering about our direct experience with light that my light recordings work begins. When I first started working with the photographic medium in 1987, I was interested in imaging things as they appeared to me in nature, landscapes, the figure, still lives, and subtle abstractions of the light. Yet at a certain point in my early photographic practice, something in me shifted for a time. I no longer felt compelled to take photographic representations of things I saw with my eyes. In 1998, a persistent conceptual question arose in my studio that I had to reckon with. Wasn't the experience of the thing itself a more intimate encounter with its true nature than the photographic representation of it? Why make an optical reproduction of a sunset or a person or an object when the real thing is happening right in front of you? Why represent anything at all when you can have an experience of it directly? These questions led me to discontinue photographing altogether for several months, during which time I pursued my interest in light through luminous pigments and painting and printmaking. But I eventually came back to the photographic medium through an unexpected discovery. Some of the most potent moments in the studio occur when it feels as though a medium is failing you. And the existential crises that these moments propel can be valuable times of unforeseen innovation. It was in this way that I discovered a method to record the nature of light that I had so longed for. 
I was making an adapter to fit my four by five inch Polaroid back into a 19th century double bellows studio camera, thinking I would try one last thing before I might give up on photography altogether. When I completed the fabrication, I installed the adapter into the camera to test it for light leaks, the photographer's nemesis. By exposing a piece of Polaroid film without opening the lens, I expected to see a fully black Polaroid. But when I peeled the developing, development enclosure to reveal the image, I found that I did have light leaking across uh, through, the, through the adapter and it was stunning. The perfectly arced gradation of light across the film. The image was everything I had been seeking from a photograph, a documentation of light itself. I immediately began exploring the light leaks potential building my own cameras in different sizes and configurations that replicated the original light leak. The light recordings process pairs photography down to its most essential ingredients, light and light sensitive material. This became the conceptual starting point for the work and compelled me to image my experiences of daily natural light phenomena. With light as both my medium and subject, the phenomena I could capture was literally endless for in every moment light is new. The questions that arose from this process were, what is the function of a photograph? In 2004, I was granted the opportunity to work in collaboration with the McDonald Observatory in far west Texas and had access to a site up on the main peak of the observatory in one of their astronomers' houses. During my two month residency, I documented a full lunar cycle through an altered telescope to produce my first video based work, a moving light work that depicted lunation cycle 1011. Lunation is the mean time between two successive moons, new moons, and the lunation number is calculated from the first new moon that occurred in 1923. Imaged through an altered telescope and self-built lenses, lensless camera devices, the varying intensities of light radiating from the moon were recorded onto handheld photographic film. The resulting images portray not only the changing quantity of moonlight in its nightly phase, but also my own hand, which in holding each piece of film over the long two minute exposures, moves slightly from my own heartbeat and body's subtle sway. This piece demonstrated to me the relationship between technology and the human implementing it. This relationship is expressed in the completed video installation where each of the exposures taken over the 30 days were animated in sequence to the, to the speed of my heartbeat to produce a moving account of the lunar cycle that is both human and planetary. By adopting a somewhat scientific methodology in my artistic process, I began to follow a rather non-traditional studio practice. And at this point, it is at this point that my inquiries led me to work alongside scientific and research institutions in order to further my knowledge of a particular field of scientific study. It was during that two month artist in residence with McDonald Observatory that my artistic direction took a new turn. Night after night, looking up at the universe through the intensely dark, unpolluted sky, I considered how few people around the world have dark enough skies to look up and see the universe clearly. In August 2007, I read that in the time of Galileo, Venus and the Milky Way were so bright in our, un our, in our then unpolluted skies that they would literally cast a person's shadow onto the ground. That is how much, how, how much things have changed. These thoughts led me to reflect on the historical versus contemporary relationship with our natural environment and our civilization. While our technologies have stunningly allowed us to see into the microcosm of our bodies and the macrocosm of the universe, we are facing a moment where our technologies are also aiding in certain destabilizing effects to the earth, the water, the air. From these late nights under the stars in 2004, the polar project sprung into being. The Polar Project is an evolving series of environment-focused works that document the Arctic and Antarctica. Though seemingly far away, these rare and fragile ecosystems are crucial to Earth's stability and humanity's future. Continued anthropogenic climate disruption and glacial melting is bringing unprecedented challenges to all of humanity and the other species that we share this planet with. After decades of leading scientists, <clears throat> of leading scientists warning of the effects of climate disruption, we are now seeing these effects with our own eyes and the amount of ice melting in these regions is increasing. The Polar Project was meant to capture and preserve the changing landscape of these regions at a time when the conversation about climate, the climate crisis was not as, as widely discussed as it is today. 
My goal was to create a series of visceral experiences of these remote yet critical landscapes so people could build a relationship with them in the hopes of cultivating a sense of ecological empathy to protect these places and ultimately our global ecosystems. It has been established across many fields that humans have a biological need for a connection with the natural world, not simply for recreation or aesthetic reasons and not solely for sustenance reasons, but for literal healthy biological function, including the health of our brains and nervous system. There is a term that was established in the mid 1990s within the field of ecological conservation that has interested me a great deal called shifting baseline syndrome. Originally used to determine baselines in fishery science, the term has become more broadly used to discuss the decline in our general knowledge of our natural surroundings and how they are changing. There are two types of shifting baselines. The first is generational amnesia, where, the, where there is loss or extinction of knowledge because younger generations are not aware of what past ecological or biological conditions were once like. The second type is personal amnesia where knowledge loss or extinction occurs because we individually forget our own experiences of nature conditions. The questions that have arisen from this research go deep. If we have a biological need for our natural world and yet we generation by generation are forgetting what this natural world was like and no longer realize we have a need for it at a fundamental level, then how can we hope to maintain a connection with our natural world that is resolute enough to protect it against further decline and devastation? How can we begin to remember we are inextricably linked to the natural world that evolved us? The questions that have guided my artistic research since the earliest days of my practice are those that seem to continuously seek to locate this sense of connectedness. My work recurrently leads me to a specific emotion that I see as a convergence of both personal and cosmic reflection, the feeling of wonder. To me, wonder is a force. It has gravity. I bend toward it. Wonder is the ether of our inner universe, elixir for mind and heart. It is the mysterious encounter with the outer world that forges an ethos of benevolence and humility in the face of vastness. In a moment when we are fully taken by wonder, it, it is as if somehow we feel a sense of unity with the object of wonder itself, as if empathy can move beyond the animate and we stand in awe of a starry night sky or the Antarctic landscape or a glowing ocean or a rock from the moon, seeking with all our faculties to feel and comprehend something of the inanimate. Research in the field of social psychology has shown empirically that during an experience of awe and wonder, we reframe our sense of self and world, and that this ability to accept a larger reality inspires us to feel small in the face of such vastness. In coming into contact with this small self frame of reference, we diminish emphasis on the individual self and self-serving interests in favor of a more altruistic perspective. We literally become more compassionate, helpful, and ethically oriented. Wonder connects us to the world and each other in measurable ways. It seems significant in our moment of social and environmental turbulence to consider how human encounters with the wonders of our natural world might contribute to compassionate, helpful, and ethically oriented decision-making. Wonder is a proponent to curiosity. We can peer across the origins of our many cultures and see that encounters with the wonders of our world have sparked some of humanity's greatest leaps of creativity and accomplishment from the very first representative paintings of cave, on a cave wall to our first steps on the moon. I've become curious about whether seeking wonder engagement could have a significant impact in our ability to face the deepening complexities of the Anthropocene. Bioluminescence is the wondrous living light that is widespread across our oceans. Although most, mostly microscopic and seemingly disconnected from our daily experience, phytoplankton produce at least 50% of the world's oxygen. They are connected to every breath we take. They are also the base of the food chain. Yet increased industrial waste has affected phytoplankton populations around our coastlines. Bays once teeming with bioluminescence have diminished or vanished altogether. 
the cli and climate disruption is increasing the temperature difference between warm, warm surface and cold deep waters, inhibiting the amount of nutrient mixing needed for phytoplankton to thrive. Losing populations of phytoplankton risk the health of our ecosystems, coastal cultural traditions, and life itself. Changes in marine ecosystems have been documented in most ocean regions around the globe, and studies have shown that populations may be down by as much as 40%. I began collaborating with marine biologist Dr. Michael Latz at his laboratory at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in 2001 and worked with him again in 2011. My intent was to learn how to care for the single-celled organism Pyrocystis fusiformis, one of the larger blue bioluminescent phytoplankton that glows in our oceans. In researching and documenting these organisms, I became aware of how incredibly sensitive to environmental changes they are, and hoped the work could activate a dialogue about the significance of even the smallest members of our ecosystem. In April of 2011, after seven months without rainfall, the Rock House fire ignited in Martha and raged across the landscape of far west Texas, devastating the region's environment. I was living at Martha, in Marfa at that time, and in those weeks while the wildfire rained, I began collecting material from the burned landscape. Carbonized trees, cacti, dirt, animal bones, grasses, and photographed the charred remains and blackened earth. By July 2011, which was the 317th consecutive month with above average global temperatures, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Climate Monitoring Division had already ranked 2011 as having seen the largest amount of acreage burned in the US from wildfires than in, three, in, in the 12 years previous. Extreme drought across the American Southwest from climactic disruption as exacerbated wildfire conditions that year, causing the largest wildfire in Arizona's history, the second largest wildfire in New Mexico's history, and the third wild, largest wildfire in Texas's history to occur within just a few months of each other. All of the burned debris in these works were collected from areas that were private, state, or federal, federally owned land. At each location I gathered debris, I was at some point evicted from the land, and in one case was asked to put back the burned material I had collected. This work considers the innate sacredness of nature alongside the human desire to own or manage the land, exploring the question, has our land management and ownership in one sense stolen the land from nature itself? In taking it back, the piece intends to resacralize nature beyond our possession of it. These works become the forensic evidence of the crime of anthropogenic climate disruption. They are eulogy to the wildfires and homage to the nature they consumed. Yet as carbon is both the building block of all life and is itself an artifact of light, these works also intend to look at the regeneration that is possible as we look for solutions. It was through working on two exhibitions of my wildfire and bioluminescence work with Cape Farewell, a UK arts organization that focuses on the cultural impacts of the climate crisis, that I was invited to join a small group of artists and scientists on their Scottish Isles Islands sailing expedition in 2011, prompting another new direction in my work. Our expedition centered around interdisciplinary discussions, research, and art making that considered the cultural impact of climate change. Our journey would take us to meet the residents to discuss the effects that rising seas and environmental changes were having on their ecosystems, communities, and culture. Witnessing the sheer magnificence of these islands' geologic wonders, I felt again my own motivation quicken to nurture cultural awareness of our innate connection to our natural world. What might be possible if wonder, scientific knowledge, and artistic knowledge all met on a level playing field? It would be two months after the expedition before my new trajectory took hold. On a quiet evening, tuned into a nerdy documentary about geology, a remarkable thing transpired. The camera panned to a geologist standing on a road cut on a highway to Inverness, Scotland from Glasgow near the edge of the great Loch Ness. 
the same one I had driven past two months previous. Amazed at this coincidence, my sense of wonder started to rise and the geologist explained that when the road was made revealing the strata of rock layer, it provided researchers an excellent view into the past that answered important questions. He explained that they came to understand that this road cut rock isn't just like the rocks in the Catskills in upstate New York, they are the same rocks. That some 450,000 million, sorry, 450,000 years ago, North America and Scotland collided and this meeting is visible. What he said next has been ringing in my ears since, but the story is in the rock. Rocks then become tomes of deep memory, stories in the form of chemistry and characteristics that can reveal messages from other worlds across time. From the moment the first rock held in warm hands met the human gaze of curiosity, the lithic realm found invitation into the evolving and restless human imagination. The earliest artworks are carved in stone by stone. Stone has been medium, tool, and canvas for our earliest vision, innovation, and inquiry. Our relationship with the lithic spans at least 2.6 million years and touches cultures from prehistory to this moment. We still collect, carve, utilize, and cherish stones. From the purest mineral forms to weathered beach cobbles, our passion for lithic engagement seems almost instinctual. But what drives this nearly conate relationship between human and rock, this intimacy between animate and inanimate worlds? Stones are, in essence, time travelers. Some are space explorers, having arrived to Earth from other planets after a journey through our solar system. I like to think of rocks as scrolls of knowledge passed down through the cosmic, planetary, and geologic ages that tell the story of primordial formation. In picking up a rock along a shoreline or mountain path, we, we evoke a moment when these forces meet the human mind and heart. We gaze into its complex structure to know something of its secrets, awaiting its tome of cosmic riddles to unravel. If one knows the language written in the stone, the answers begin to emerge. In my inquiry into the connection between living flesh and solid rock, I like to imagine that something of the shared chemical inheritance lingers, like natural memory, beckoning our wonder to excavate our shared sidereal origins. Somewhere in the fiery core of ancient stars is written the verse to the molecules in your body. Somewhere in the microscopic glint of a space traveling rock is written the verse to the molecules in your body. Somewhere in the, heart, in the heart of your human chemistry is written the connection to the universe around you. In the presence of the infinitude of cosmic, planetary, and geologic timescales, the human timescale, the cycle of one human life, can feel staggeringly brief and separate from the continuum. Yet from wielding stone to building telescopes, human curiosity can now gaze back some 13.8 billion years across cosmic time to which the elements which comprise stone and flesh first began to form. Do we not then, in some poetic sense, occupy the same space as infinity? Perhaps this is why we have looked to stones for eons, because it is in, the same, in a same similar poetic sense, stones are a pathway toward the infinite. If stones hold memory, then meteorites that have been picked up by human hands have a particularly unique and intricate story to tell, one that spans stellar remnant stellar chemistry, the forming and collision of planets out of, pre, out of the pre-nebular dust, and human curiosity. These rocks from space have been culturally revered for millennia. One of the earliest known artifacts denoting the meeting of humans and meteorites are nine small hand-formed beads found in Egypt that were made by hammering meteoritic iron with a tool made of earthen rock. They are considered one of the earliest examples of metalwork and tell the unlikely but nevertheless true story of a stone from one planet body being used to reform the stone of another, all by the force of human creativity. Yet the meteorites themselves were an amalgam of elements forged during the formation of the solar system and hammered by the force of much larger rocks through the cataclysm of planetary breakup and bombardment. Although at vastly different magnitudes, how elegant the symmetry that the same elements of rock, heat, and force were required to create both a meteorite that fell from its original planetoid to Earth. 
and a bead made from that meteorite to adorn a living being. Rock and flesh continue their entwined journey. Might the human who created these beads have somehow sensed the remarkable story that lay buried in its mineral structure? Certainly they, they may have known these beads fell from the sky as there are records of meteorite falls dating back millennia, including a crater to the south of Egypt now thought to have formed at about the same time. The Egyptian word associated with iron translates literally to mean iron from the sky. Meteorites have touched imaginations and emotions across history. They were worshiped and sometimes feared by so many cultures across the ages that volumes have been written about their veneration and significance. Various cultures believed that they were sent by the gods. Some thought they were the gods themselves. Others thought they were endowed with souls. They have held many and sometimes contradictory meanings as talisman, bad omen, and possessor of powers that could both start and end wars. Meteorites are intensely studied by scientists all over the world and the science of meteoritics having come into being in the early 1800s. From these stones, lengthy scrolls of cosmochemistry and physical features, we have learned the age of the earth and the formation timeline of the early solar system. We have discovered grains of material that literally predate our solar system, grains that would be older than 4.6 billion years. We can read the signature of time passing to know how long ago a meteorite fell to Earth and how long ago its various mineral class were formed. We can read the cataclysmic event it the cataclysmic events it encountered because this, because this physical shock is still visible in the mineral structure. We've classified many varying types of meteorites and have correlated them to asteroids, recounting the story of ancient planet bodies. We have deciphered in the microcosm of meteorites the script of water and the building, building blocks of life and the rock's collaboration in bringing these elements along with others to Earth. We have read in the Earth's topography their collisions with our planet and the part they have played in certain aspects of our own planet's formation and biological evolution. Written in the great volumes of Earth's stratigraphy, there is one ancient layer of rock that is of particular meaning to us humans a thin layer of clay stone about one centimeter thick. This layer in the geologic record has been found at locations across the globe to contain high percentages of meteoritic material. The aftermath of the cataclysmic force of the Chicxulub asteroid hitting our planet 66 million years ago. Estimated to have been up to nine miles wide and with the impact equivalent, equivalence of several million nuclear weapons. To say this rock shook the very foundation of our planet would not be overstating it. Known as the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event, nearly 75% of all species perished. No four-legged land creature over 55 pounds survived, and die-offs among the planets, among the plants, plankton, and marine animals devastated global ecosystems. This stark reminder that we live amidst a dynamic solar system that continues its restless legacy of collision events should not overshadow the incredible tenacity that life has expressed again and again on this planet. Over the tens of thousands of years of rebounding organisms and adaptations that followed the mass extinction, what is remarkable is that this asteroid of impact made room for certain mammals, mammal species to radiate, including the one from which we evolved. How poignant and poetic that a stone large enough to decimate the era of one species yielded conditions for the emergence of another species, one that would come to love stone in a symbolic and ritualized way over millennia, eventually creating the science and technology that would reveal this story. A species that could reflect on its own place within the geologic tomes it could now read. The acceptance that shooting stars were in fact meteors, which occasionally produced falling stones from space, was fraught with contention, contentious disagreement until the early 19th century. In the Age of Enlightenment, which what would have eventually become what would eventually become formal disciplines, were still wresting themselves away from a conglomerate of ideologies, all seeking an individual stance and separate modes of truth upon which to defend their positions. In 1790, a fireball exploded over the south of France, and although official testimony of the event was given by the town's mayor and 300 eyewitnesses, their confessions were seen by the emerging empirically-based science community as a sort of madness. 
To believe this, that stones fell from the heavens was an affront to the age of reason, akin to the more mystical and religious realms that the new science was quickly separating from. The editor of a notable science journal published a statement about these testimonies saying, how sad is it not to see a whole municipality attempt to certify the truth of folk tales? In a paper allegedly, in a paper published the same year entitled On Some Stones Allegedly Fallen from Heaven, which set out to discredit the testimony, the assistant director of the Imperial Natural History Collection in Vienna wrote, it was said that the iron fell from heaven. It may have been possible for even the most enlightened minds in Germany to have believed such things in 1751 due to the terrible ignorance then prevailing of natural history and practical physics. But in our time, it would be unpardonable to regard such fairy tales as likely. Though stones falling from the sky seem preposterous to the emerging sciences, in spite of extensive public documentation over thousands of years, it was through the rigor of knowledge seeking and the courage to face the tension of minds on both sides of the argument that the astonishing truth was finally revealed. As if to res resolutely appeal to our hope that wonder prevails in the face of mystery revealed, we learned through objective study and empirical methods that the world of, ph world of phenomena can be a reverie in its own true nature, that stones can and do fall from the sky. I have often mused while stargazing about the photons that have traveled across the vastness of time and space from a distant star, nebula, or galaxy, only to end their long journey by landing on the retina of my eye. Has anyone calculated such odds? Although distinctly poetic, it is not far-fetched in the least to say that in turning our eyes to the starry night sky, we receive energy from each luminous object we look at. Whether that photon left the binary star system Sirius the brightest star in our night sky and traveled the 8.6 light years to reach my eye, or whether it left the Andromeda galaxy and traveled the 2.5 million light year distance. At the very moment that photon meets my retina, it is immediately absorbed by my body. Of the two types of cells in our eye, the, the rod cells are phenomenally more sensitive to low light and can respond to the meeting of a single photon. When a photon hits the retina, the photon's light energy interacts with photosensitive receptor molecules in the eye's cells, prompting a process whereby the photon is essentially converted to atomic motion, generating nerve cells to be sent to the brain. This all happens in a trillionth of a second. We generally need at least several photons to absorb in quick succession in order for the brain to register the sensation. But if you can see the object, then you are already receiving ample photons from it. In the case of the Andromeda galaxy, it is, it is possible in dark skies to see its faint fuzzy glow with the naked eye. Imagine 2.5 million year old starlight photons interacting directly with our brains in less than a second upon arrival. And all we have to do to participate in this dazzling intersection of cosmic and human timescales is to look up at the stars. During my nearly five years living under the dark night sky in far west Texas, I remember camping one December in Big Bend National Park to watch the Gemini, Gemini meteor shower, counting 279 shooting stars over two nights. It was my longing for this sort of direct interaction with night sky phenomena, living here under the urban skies in Houston, that propelled my Encyclopedia of Trajectories project. This piece, which is still in progress, intends to study the notion of an embodied relationship with the stars and began with an inquiry into how, in our human form, can we comprehend the enormity of our, com of our cosmic heritage, that we are in our very chemistry of and from the stars. I wanted to find a way to acknowledge this lineage every day, not just in my thoughts, but in my body. In June 2017, I decided I would draw every shooting star for one year as a way to bring an experience of the stars into my physical form. The work has become a daily practice of learning to embody the stars by reenacting the trajectories of meteors across the night sky through the trajectory I can achieve by moving my hand, moving my hand across a page with a brush. Using a traditional inkbrush, I'm performing each meteor event that occurred 
between June 21, 2017 and June 21, 2018 as a single stroke drawing on paper using 24 karat gold. Gold seemed the ultimate material to draw meteors because this precious material arrived to Earth by meteor bombardment during our planet's early formation. We have also recently come to understand that the element of gold itself originated in the merging of neutron stars, which produces a kilonova event thought powerful enough to create the heavier elements, including gold. Remarkably, of the 5,763 shooting stars that I have now collected for this project and continue to draw, I did not see a single one with my own eyes. As far back as we can see in the material remains of our species lineage, cultures have looked to the stars to answer some of the most fundamental human questions, whether to locate or understand our place in the universe or to reflect on the meaning of our lives. Last month, I launched my project Sky Scrolls, a web-based archive of our stories of the, sky, of the stars, showcasing story submissions from people around the world. The idea sprung into being in 2014 while researching our relationship to the cosmos. Learning about the ecological biodiversity and human health related impacts due to the loss of our natural night sky from artificial light pollution, I became interested in tracing the impact a view of the stars has had on cultural continuity. Our stories are the cultural evidence of what we hold as meaningful in our hearts and minds, and sharing them allows for a kind of social remembering. Story roots us in personal, social, and cultural experiences and has the ability to move beyond time and place. Studies in neuroscience have shown that what traditional knowledge and cultural making practices have known since their onset, that stories can guide us toward empathy, social justice, and personal transformation. When, when telling st our stories to others, the part of the brain that regulates moral sensibility and empathy are illuminated in both speaker and listener. In marking our current personal and global moment through our stories under the night sky, stars and stories can be reflections of each other. Stargazing is something we can do from our backyards, our front stoop, our rooftop, our windows. Especially in this time of solitude, isolation, and lockdowns, stargazing can connect us even when we are apart. Looking up at the stars together, our eyes themselves become their own constellation. In January 2013, I approached NASA with a proposal to make a 3D virtual library of their astromaterials collections. My idea began with a simple inquiry. Might it be possible to hold a rock in one's hand that told the story of the whole cosmos? Building on my work linking natural phenomena and human meaning, my proposal was to make their Apollo Lunar Sample Collection and Antarctic Meteorite Collection more accessible to researchers, educators, and the general public. I was interested in delving into and sharing, sharing widely and interactively the stories, both cultural and scientific, woven within these rocks from space. Would we know these stories more intimately if we could somehow hold these stones in our hand virtually? Could a direct encounter with these stones and stories provide a pathway to experience the depth of our connection with the cosmos? The project represents a phenomenal meeting between the fields of art, science, and technology. Over the last eight years, I've had the great honor to lead a truly singular team at NASA's Astromaterial Research and Exploration Science Division at Johnson Space Center to develop the technical capacity to achieve this goal. And in December of last year, we launched the problem the project to the public. After receiving a NASA Rose's PDART grant in 2016 to produce this project, I've spent, I spent three years manually photographing hundreds of angles of 60 rocks inside their nitrogen cabinets in NASA's clean room facilities. My experience spending time with these fragments from our solar system has been deeply meaningful for me, fueling me to persist through the many challenges my team and I encountered as we carved a novel path to create this final work. Our process combines high resolution precision photography, structure from motion photogrammetry, and X-ray computed tomography to produce research grade interactive 3D models of both the exterior and the interior 
of each lunar and meteorite sample as a single virtual object within the same coordinate system. We designed the website and custom explorer application software to be an active storytelling experience where the viewer goes deeper and deeper into the origin stories of these rocks. Astromaterials 3D is as much a rigorous research oriented library as it is a public artwork meant to deepen our sense of wonder and knowledge of our solar system through a virtual holding of these rare and remarkable rocks in our hands. At its core, Astromaterials 3D intends to provide greater access to NASA's space rock collections, making their encyclopedic stories accessible to curious minds across all disciplines and ages. In December, we launched the first 20 lunar and meteorite samples, and the global response to the project has been overwhelming. We will add another 40 rocks to the, over the next six months, and we are now looking toward the future to sample return missions underway and planned that will bring rocks back from asteroids and other planet bodies. This is just the beginning. One of the responsibilities that I feel artistic knowledge has when in collaboration with scientific knowledge is to nurture and defend the important role that meaning has in our search for understanding the mechanisms of our world. That meaning is as important as truth. Feeling value plays a critical role in our ability to maintain our sense of humanity and it is becoming ever more discussed that the role of empathetic exchange across disciplines may well define the future of problem solving and our ability to balance the many social environmental change challenges we face as a species. Might seeking encounters with the wonders of our world foster a much needed healing for our times? How far reaching is our capacity to connect ourselves to our world? Could the practice of engaging in states of wonder every day help us remember and maintain our eons long connection and love for the world that evolved us? Can wonder lead to an empathetic response to our current environmental and social predicaments, reminding us that we are connected to the entire cosmos? The story of connection is all around us, in the stars in the night sky, in the rocks under our feet, and in the blood surging in our hearts and minds. Thank you so much. And I'd love to invite Tom and Joseph to come join me and have a conversation. Um, uh, that, that was great. Thank you for being here. Like the, the amount of research you do like deserves respect and it's like immense. Um, going off of that like um like your research is equally as important as like the final outcome of your artwork like can you speak about your thinking process about like a choice in like one of your pieces might not just be aesthetic but connected to your research and maybe uh like you could talk about a specific uh, area um like speaking about a particular a particular artwork or Maybe, sorry, maybe I'm not understanding the question. Can you? No, it's like, for example, um, yeah. how you're, um, yeah, for example, like what we're working on the Island Press, but also like how you're talking about the, the use of gold leaf connected to the meteorites and like yeah. different thinking processes like that. Yeah, and well, I'm always looking, I mean, I'm always looking for the connections, right? And I feel like when I can work materially with, um, with, can, you know, when, when, when I can work with materials that, in, that are imbued with the conceptual intent that I'm, that I'm after um, in my questioning, then, then they seem to make sense as works of art. Like, uh, you know, for example, working with, you know, photographically trying to pare photography down to its most basic ingredients so that I could record just light or it, like you're saying, working with the gold um, in trying to draw meteors, um, meteors having brought gold to earth. Um, I'm always looking for ways to, to thread the meaning, um, the conceptual meaning in to the, both the materials and in the works that I'm portraying. Yeah, and that, that's like beautiful and also creates like poetic languages as well, you know? Yeah, thank you. I, I feel them. I mean, I think that's why I, I, um, I'm magnetized to them because I, I can feel that that um, that quality of connection and and it inspires me um, 
to learn more about it and to understand how they're connected. Oh yeah, I mean, it's it's almost like, um, it, it's maybe even a little bit connected to what we're doing here at Island Press, but it's a, it's a gesture back to space or a gesture back to yeah. the time, which mm -hmm. is really, um, you know, it's like, I feel like I'm still unpacking your talk right now in my head. I wrote down all these questions that, you know, um, that I was thinking during the time. And I guess one of the threads that came up through the talk that I found um, interesting, and I'd like to hear why you hung on that word so, so strongly was the use of the word scrolls. And it's like, I think when I hear the word scrolls, I instantly go to like Dead Sea Scrolls and like sort of, you know, deep earth time, you know, in terms of human stuff. Yeah. And, um, but it's something that you use when you were talking about like the road cut and you were taught you um, uh, were talking about the like the engravings that people had made on stone and things like that so can you expand on that a little bit yeah I mean I I feel like you know some of our first markings I mean our first markings were made um, on stone as far as we can tell um, you know the, this idea of of symbolizing our our intent or our world or finding ways to communicate um, has always been there's always been a relationship to um, to stone, and I and so I loved the idea that in geology, um, geologists will talk about you know the stories in the rock, and and that that the rocks themselves are stories, and they and you can unravel these stories just like you might unravel you know the Dead Sea Scrolls or you know a cuneiform. Um, tablet and and so there just seem to be these these real link ups with our the development of our language the development of symbolic thought and th symbolic um, practices of, of art making and marking and how these marks tell these stories in the same way that our natural world can tell these stories too and I I, I just I think this this link up between um, between, it, I don't know, just the link up for me really, really is powerful within the idea of, of scrolls and writing. Um, and that that's also how we learn and, and share with each other. Yeah, that slow reveal that you get, you know, when you're looking at a scroll, you know, having that there. Um, Joseph, I don't want, were you going to say something? Oh, no, no, no. I was oh, like, okay. I guess, uh, yeah. go, go for it. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> I think something that would uh, be beneficial is like, you know, your approach to like, um, like uh, being a part of like all these like NASA and the Scripps uh, oceanography and um, the observatory in Marfa like is not like tradition of like a normal artist residency, but you would apply for like, can you speak to like about that process and how, what's that like, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, it is, it is unusual. Um, yeah, those were, those were all opportunities that I, I inquired after on my own initiative. So, um, and I think that's, that's become a really important part of, of my practice in some ways is to, to not be afraid to kind of cross, cross these boundaries that we think are impassable, right? Um, and certainly I, I did also for a time, but when I started to peek over and say, hey, you know, Michael Latz, do you want to talk about the link up between art and science and, and maybe do a project together? Um, and seeing how that evolved gave me the confidence to try it again with the McDonald Observatory and ask them if it was if it would be possible to work with them. And, you know, up to asking NASA um, if if they wanted to do this project. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's, it's, I always feel like I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to disappoint artists when I tell them that there's no, um, there's no artist in residence program at NASA. Um, <laughs> but I hope, I hope what I can convey is that, um, when there isn't a program, that doesn't mean there aren't possibilities and that, that ultimately our world needs interdisciplinary thinking and cross-disciplinary thinking. And so that we really, 
move beyond these separations between what we think, how we think these, these fields of knowledge are supposed to be divided. And um, I encourage everybody to do that. And, and I, I hope to continue doing it myself. Thank you, that's inspiring, you know? Yeah, totally. Yeah. There's, um, there's this, this, you know, really interesting uh, connection that you have between um, technology and like the, the kind of the human gesture, the human kind of touch and things. And, you know, early on in the, in your photo, in the photographs, like the, the camera that you had built, you were doing the, the test to see if there was a light leak and that led you in that direction. So it's like this kind of like human recognition of these flaws in technology um, that you embrace. But then there's also, it's like when you're doing the Astro Materials project with NASA, it's like when, you're wa when we're watching those cross sections happen in your animation and your talk, they really, they feel like, and maybe they were even done this way, but they feel like an MRI. Yeah. And they really like visually, I really connect to them in a human way. And it's something about the cadence and the way that they go through things. And you see, it's like, it's, it's just a really beautiful way to, to give them life, you know, in a way that we're, you know, I guess it's sad that we've all gotten so used to seeing MRIs in our life <laughs> you know, for different reasons, but to take that and, and turn something that's inanimate and make it animate and feel human is pretty cool. That's such a great, yeah, that's such a great um, question and, and, and um, perception, Tom. Like I, I, I agree, I mean, it, and it is, it is x-ray. So it's exactly what you feel like it is. Um, and, and I think that's kind of why I love it. It's like, we, you know, we have used this, um, technology to peer into our own bodies and now we're using it to peer into the bodies of rocks and actually that's exactly how it started. Um, X-ray computed tomography of geologic samples was developed actually mostly at UT, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago by um, the department basically taking an X-ray um, machine from a hospital uh, a CT, a CT scanning uh, machine from a hospital, and recalibrating it for um, for geologic specimens. And so, but what I love is this is this interplay between um, kind of complicating the relationship between technology and the human implementing it, and also complement um, complicating the the processes that we go through when we're choosing methods of, or modes of communication. So in some cases I am invisible in the work. And then in some cases I am not invisible in the work. And some, you know, mostly when I'm present, um, there's some kind of reason for that, for me to be there. Um, I'm always there, really. <laughs> but, but whether you see me or not is another, is another thing, but I love that because I think there's that tension between in the sciences where, where there's the feeling that you have to remain invisible um, and objective in order to maintain that objectivity, which I think is really um, needs to be re-looked at in, a, in new ways, of course. Um, I don't know what really is objectivity when, when we're expressing it. Um, and so then there, I like, I like thinking those about the, that as a, it's a problem. It's an, it's an interesting conundrum that we've created for ourselves. Um, well, Erica, do you want to talk more about uh, what you're doing with Island Press now? Yeah. Yeah. I'd be delighted. Um, I can, I've got a few more slides here can share with you. Okay. So um, about a year and a bit ago, I started working on a project that um, looks at the Harvard Observatory's collection of glass plate, astronomical glass plate negatives. And so 
in the late 1800s, the Harvard Observatory began hiring groups of women um, and they became known as the Harvard Observatory Computers. And they came from all walks of life and some were educated, um, very well educated and, and some were not educated. But, um, and it was at a time when women obviously were struggling for basic rights, but these women um, were hired by Harvard to, to catalog and um, catalog these hundreds of thousands of glass plate negatives that were being photographed from all regions of the, of the world of the night sky. Um, and, and they helped revolutionize the science of astronomy um, through their study and their cataloging of, of, um, of these hundreds of thousands of photographs of stars. And, you know, for example, like Wilhelmina Peyton Fleming worked on spectra and dwarf stars and developed a classification of stars based on their hydrogen content. She also discovered the Horsehead Nebula and many, many, many other deep, deep sky objects. Um, Annie Jump Cannon produced a stellar classification system that we still use today. Um, Henrietta Swan Levitt showed that the cyclical changes in brightness of certain variable stars um, could be used to measure great distances across space. Um, there were a few dozen women over um, the decades, um, and they all contributed greatly to the field of astronomy and astrophysics. And these are some of the photographs um, of them. And so what I became interested in is, um, is the, what's called the digital access to a sky century, century at Harvard, which is abbreviated to DASH. Um, so the DASH project was inspired essentially um, because it's a century's worth of the night sky. Um, and so, you know, astronomers wanted, and astrophysics physicists wanted to use the data to start looking at exoplanets um, over, over time, or for looking for exoplanets by looking at um, repetitive images of, of areas of the sky. And so they decided to digitize the entire collection and make it publicly available, which is amazing. Um, however, in doing that, what they needed to, what they felt like they needed to do was to um, clean the glass plates before they scanned them. So as you can see here, these two plates, um, these are two that have been wiped clean. They contained the drawings of the women who were doing the research. So the women, the, the Harvard computers, when they were making notations or counting stars or trying to um, uh, catalog the stars or their spectra, they would make these beautiful notations across the plate to, to maintain, to keep track of their science. And so I was really deeply saddened when I learned that the, the plates were being wiped and that these incredible um, drawings which depict the aesthetic searching um, of their exploration and the stars um, was being wiped away forever. So I decided to, to work with the digital um, images of the plates before they were wiped. They, they arc for before they, they would wipe them, they actually documented the markings and um, they allow, they provide an, a high resolution image to the public of, of the markings. So what we're doing is, um, my goal is to, to return them to the stars, um, is to return the marks to the stars through printing them in gold. Um, so we're do, what we're doing is essentially lifting the, um, the marks off the image. Um, so we're kind of doing the opposite of what they did. Um, we're taking the marks and we're putting them um, where rather than throwing them, we are placing them front and center in the, in the image area. And so, um, you know, like you were talking about earlier, Joseph, um, it was very important to me to work with materials that imbued these ideas that, that, um, that they were working with and, and also that referenced the, the glass plates and the history of photography and, um, and the astro astronomy and astrophysics. So gold was, is the, we're printing in gold because again, that, that's a material that was formed in the collision of neutron stars. And um, we're printing on top of a, um, 
cyanotype background. So cyanotype was invented by astronomer John Herschel, and he created the photographic, this photographic process, um, what became a photographic process, um, essentially to copy his own astronomical notes. So I loved this correlation between it being invented by an astronomer, but then it became a photographic process that has been used um, to, to print photographs. And so we are creating um, a, a heavy cyanotype background to sort of imbue and it, that is exposed to light um, and, and developed, but without an image. Um, and so it's just, it's just exposed to light and then we're printing on top of that. Um, yeah, I love that connection you brought into like the plates and like uh, I like in general, like how you research the origin of like the materials you're working with, like it can like benefit, you know, the overall concept. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it feels really important to to think that through really, really well, um, particularly since they're so important. I mean, these I mean, what I love is that it's it's an these were aesthetic decisions um, that relate to their scientific explorations. And so I love that there is really is these connections and they're, and they're, they're beautiful. They're, they're absolutely drawings. Um, yeah, we've really been, they've, you know, they've, we've had some pretty great conversations about them and how they make us, they make us think about different artists yeah. and yeah, where they come together, you know, um, if anybody has any specific, more specific questions about the Island Press project, you can drop it into the Q&A, but we're getting kind of a big um, backlog in here. Okay. So I think I'm gonna just go ahead and read a few um, off of here um, for you, uh, for you to, um, to tackle. This, this one, uh, excuse me, especially in a time like today, the idea of documenting the everyday and the routine is becoming more popular. Where do you think this will all lead the art of photography in the next few in the next few years, especially given your unorthodox approach to photography as documentation? It's a big question. Wow, that is a great question. That is a hard question. I mean. I think even as we look across the history of photography, we, we, we have always photographed the quotidian. I mean, it's just now we, we have the ability to, to share more images at greater frequency and far wider than, than before, certainly. But I'm just thinking of like, you know, images of, of you know, the repetition of images of um, Moybridge and just, you know, looking at just, how, how life operates. And I think that in some ways, what you're talking about in terms of documenting the everyday and the routine, um, I don't think that that means that, I don't think it's going to exclude the imaginary. Um, I think that we still need the imaginary and, and that there's a great amount of photography that's sort of combining these these spaces, these, you know, where these, these two spaces of like, what's, you know, documenting, what's, what's documentary, but what's also linking up with imaginary spaces or imaginary worlds. Um, I, I really feel that that's still, that's still alive and in our, in our world, in our photography. We may have to look beyond our social media platforms to find it. <laughs> as quickly as, as the universe right right I, I just I think I mean this was probably already 10 years ago now I don't know what it is now but I remember reading some some something about like how many billions of photographs are taken every year now um, but I don't think it diminishes I mean it's like a pen how many you know writing hasn't gotten any any worse <laughs> because because you know, more people read and write and um, have the instruments they need to do so. It just gets more interesting. Yeah. 
So I have, a, I have another question from the audience. Like, um, it, and I feel like it could be your last one potentially. Like, it says, uh, you speak so poetically about your work. How did you discover and develop your voice as an artist? And I think it also could speak to like, what, well, like, what are your overall goals? Like, what impact do you want to have in your audience? You know. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, and thank you for for your kind words. Um. It took me a while, really, honestly, to develop um, the language of the work. I, I think that um, I really feel like it's only been within the last maybe three or four years that I've really started to understand what the impulse of research and and learning and and you know what seemed like all of these different trajectories going off in different directions and. Um, I knew somehow they were all threaded together, but I, I sometimes didn't always see it myself, but I just kept following it. And it was so important to just trust the creative process and trust the creative imagination because um, I think in the studio, we, it's, it's, all we, it's all we can give ourselves really is that trust. And we may not always know where we're going um, or, or, and we may not always see how we got there when we get there, but but I really feel like it, it took me a while to really sink into what I, what I wanted to, um, what I really wanted to talk about and what I really wanted to explore and how I wanted to share that. And I have to say, it's only been in the last few years that I've even shared any of the writing and the research. Um, that was something that was always behind the scenes. And it took me a while to accept that I was a researcher and that that was part of my practice. Um, and I think that I think that artists are researchers and, and, and yet we don't, we haven't always had the language to, to be accepting of that. And I think that more and more artists are seeing that about themselves and, and, and are, are putting that forward. And I, I think it's such an important thing because, you know, artistic knowledge has a lot to, has a lot to give um, this world. And, and I guess that would be, you know, my greatest hope is that, is that, Artistic knowledge is as um, is as sound and as, as significant as the other disciplines of knowledge that we we often assume have more um, more weight. And I I I think that it's really time that that artistic knowledge be seen for for what it is. And um, and it's important for us to to have the courage to develop, to develop that voice. And it's not easy. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's really true. Yeah, well let's, said. We can, if you can, let's, let's just do one more. This, um, and then I think this will be the last question. Um, you mentioned how you questioned, what's the purpose of, a, of photography? I am curious if you found the answer to that question from an archival characteristic of photography. If so, I'd, re I'd really appreciate it if you could talk more about photography as a medium that represents reality slash truth. What do you think about photography's objectivity and subjectivity? Mm, wow, that is a lot. Thank you, that's a great question. Um, wow, well, I guess, you know, I mean, I feel, to be honest, I feel that the idea that photography is objective is as troublesome to me as thinking that science is objective. Um, and so, but I also think that we can learn through their perspectives of documentation, even if we know that, that um, even if we know that there is some perspective that's coming behind it, right? I mean, certainly, I mean, I, I think for myself, what I've discovered is that, is that I'm, I'm always going to be involved with the photographic medium because I, I adore the idea of archiving and of documenting the world around me. Um, and, and I love that that's a practice that we do as humans. Um, and we do try to be objective, but at the same time, like I don't know why that's always our goal. 
um, because it it in it it means that we um, we forget who we are in that process, right? And perhaps remembering is is what helps us learn along the way that we need to make adjustments um, as we go along. So I don't know if I don't know if I'm really answering your question, but but I guess that's what it makes me think of. Um, well, that, that, that's a that is a, that was a great answer. I thought yeah. that was a really great answer to that. Um, I think we should probably we should probably cut it off there. Um, Erica and Joseph, thank you so much um, for this evening. This was this was really lovely. Thank you to everybody. I cannot see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We can only see each other. Um, <laughs> But thank you to everybody for attending tonight. If anybody um, wants any more information about the project, you can always email us at islandpress um, at woostel.edu. Um, if you're a student here, please come by and check out what's going, um, what's going on. And uh, we're going to be adding more slots for, um, for sign up coming here um, pretty soon in the future. So um, yeah. Thanks, Erica. Thanks, Joseph. And thank you, Lisa. And um, yeah, I think we'll just, we'll, we'll call it there. I don't know really how to end this. Because <laughs> yeah, and sorry we couldn't answer all the questions. There's a ton yeah. of great questions, but uh, yeah. just so you know, Erica's going to uh, see them later uh, after this. Like I will. Time. And um, if, I, if I can, I will, I will try to answer them. You can always email me through my website and I can try to get back to you. Thank you so much, everybody, um, for joining and for, for all your great questions. I look forward to continuing the conversation. <laughs>